All right, well, good morning, everyone. I think this is here. Is this here as a fail safe, uh, Stephen? So I think we've failed. I mean, we haven't failed yet, so it's still safe. I'm going to move this down a little bit out of my face if I can do that. I'll do that. And then I'll cause some other corner conniption here. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kauser. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you, Don, for welcoming me this morning. Uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, today and uh, we were gone over these last couple weeks Ron and I we were at a uh, a destination wedding in Ireland uh, over the last couple weeks uh, and so we had a, a nice little break for ourselves it wasn't the best time uh, to be away uh, it was uh, our niece uh, Rana's uh, sister's daughter who got married and so we were up in some place called Letterkenny up in the north uh, west uh, side of Ireland over there and then we took a couple days to relax on the other side of that and then we came back immediately to get Rana back to work because she needs to work so that we can have what we need to survive. So I just took the time off but she's back at work uh, when we got back. Uh, but uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, you've been, you're on our hearts. It, it is something how, um, um, as Paul would often say, uh, even though we were not here with you, uh, you were in our prayers uh, when we were not with you. Uh, we prayed uh, for Emmanuel, I'm sure, every day, some of you by name, uh, and for you as a church uh, to walk with the Lord, to be faithful uh, with him. And so we're so glad to be back with you uh, and look forward to uh, a summer. Uh, Ron and I are both educators uh, and on our side jobs, if you will, that we have. And so we come into the summer uh, and we are one of those irritating people that get the summers off. Uh, for those people who didn't get the summers off. One of the hard things about our daughters is they grew up, none of them are educators, and so every job that they have, uh, they have been conditioned for the whole of their life to have the summer off, and surprisingly, other jobs don't do that for some reason, uh, to their great irritation. Uh, and so they have said to us more than once that we have spoiled them uh, in terms of that, but uh, can't help it. That's just what we did. Well, I want to draw our attention uh, to a number of things this morning. But I want to begin with the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 18. Now, just if you want to get prepared here for a little bit later, our text today is going to be Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you want to turn there and be ready to go or have your electronic device all ready to roll. Uh, I hope you have a pen and a pencil so that you can write down something that the Lord wants to teach you this morning. Uh, you know, and sometimes what the Lord wants to do is he wants to affirm a truth that you already know and reassert it and bring it to mind to, so that you can recall it. Uh, sometimes he wants to take a truth that you know and then ask you to bring it back in relationship with your life and see if that truth is actually serving to control the way you think and live. Sometimes the Spirit of God is going to use the truth to convict you of sin uh, when you're walking away into a path of destruction or you're missing out on God's love and mercy. He wants to do that. Sometimes he's going to take a truth and move you to action to do something for somebody or to do something towards someone, like to ask forgiveness or to reconcile or to do those things. God's always at work uh, in this moment. And at the same time, I want to remind you that the evil one's always at work too. And we know what his uh, activities are to distract you, uh, to make you elevate things that aren't important, to make them important, right? So he wants to point out to you, right? He wants to... Uh, have you look forward, he always wants Jacob to look forward and see Andy right there in front of him. Uh, and then something Andy's going to do, which Andy doesn't know that he's going to do, is going to become a focus of what Jacob thinks about. And then all of a sudden he's lost to what's going on uh, in the moment. Sometimes it's an irritating thing, sometimes it's just an interesting thing. But you can be uh, aware of the fact that in a culture where we've already compromised our attention spans greatly, <laughs> that something's going to try to get your attention today. So I want to encourage you to ask the Lord to give you strength to stay focused so that you can hear what the, God wants to tell us today. So here we are, Matthew 16, verse 18. This is a well-known verse. This is Jesus speaking to Peter in Matthew 16, just following the moment when uh, Jesus asked his disciples to identify themselves with respect to his identity. It's that famous question, uh, after he asked them, who do people say that I am? He asked them directly, who do you say that I am? And Peter came back with the right answer. He said, you're the Messiah. You're the promised Davidic king that we've been anticipating and looking forward to. And you're the son of God. You're God of very God. 
So he recognized who Jesus was, but of course at this moment, Peter's a growing disciple. He doesn't know half of what he just confessed, and it shows up in his behavior soon thereafter. But at this moment, Jesus steps in and he gives him a promise that based on the apostles, this group of people that are, he's leading, this 12 minus Judas who's going to flame out, but these 11 who are here are going to be the foundation of this new movement called the church and that this church will prevail and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So this is what he says to Peter. And I tell you, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now here Jesus made it clear that his people exist in the face of opposition. Their identity and mission will be resisted. Nevertheless, he promised that his church will not fail. All those who believe in him as their Savior and Lord will unfailingly experience all that God has promised them in Christ and the saving mission he wants to accomplish in and through them until he returns will not fail. However, Jesus did not promise that individual churches would not fail. History is full of examples of local church bodies failing either because they left him and so lost their identity or because they were persecuted out of existence. They have been crushed from both forces outside of them and forces within them. For this reason, there are many local church bodies that literally cease to exist or have spiritually gone out of existence. There are not a few countries or regions where the church has been fragmented and forced underground. One of, the, one of the surprising things of history is when you look across the Middle East, the birth of the church, just how, how rare, how empty the area of the Middle East is of gospel witness. Any church will only continue as a body and maintain its God-given identity and mission by the grace of God. And why do we need the grace of God? And I would say the mercy of God. Mercy and grace, uh, scripturally, just to, to use these two terms, mercy is always something that God dispenses in the face of adversity. So mercy comes to people who are hurting, people who are lost, people who are being persecuted. And so God's mercy is prayed for in those moments. Grace is more general in the terms of God's enablement, his spiritual favor, his strengthening that enables people to stay in the path of his favor and to experience his transforming work. But if you've got any church, any given body that's going to survive on time, it's attributed to God's grace and mercy. And why do we need his grace and mercy? Well, we need his grace and mercy to provide leaders, to draw people to himself, to give wisdom to navigate challenges. Anybody who's been around any given church for a period of time knows that there's a few challenges that come our way. To inspire vision, to give favor with secular authorities, right? We have in America at this moment, we have a position of favor, at least legally a position of favor, not in terms of social kind of cachet or social reputation, but in terms of legal protections, we have favor to be able to meet here this morning and not have to worry about the Xenia police coming in uh, and uh, not operating our uh, audiovisual material as Steve Lane is doing today, but instead come in and arrest everybody for worshiping Jesus. So we don't, we don't have to worry about that. We have favor from God. We need God's mercy to restore wanderers, people who've wandered away and come back, to sustain hope and mission in the face of discouragement. Anybody who's followed Christ over any length of time has faced discouragement. Discouragement in your home, discouragement in your personal life, discouragement with other Christians. Okay? We need God's mercy and grace to open and reopen hearts of brothers and sisters to each other. Right? I've come to, when Jesus, you know, at Peter, this is a little later on in Matthew 18, and Peter is trying to figure out what it means to live as a part of this new community that, that Jesus is founding. And he says, you know, if somebody sins against me, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive them? Like seven times, right? Which seems like a lot, right? That even to ask me to do it twice sounds like a lot, right? And Jesus comes back and says, how about 70 times seven? And Peter must have gone, you gotta be kidding, right? In terms of that. And as I've thought about what Jesus said there, often... Forgiveness is something you extend to the same person over and over for the same thing. 
And very seldom is it 490 separate things. It's somebody who hurt you deeply and did something really difficult and hard to you at one time. And the evil one keeps trying to raise that up in between you and your relationship over and over again. And you have to choose. And the word for forgive means to put away, right? To remove as an obstacle between you and that other person. And you have to continually choose to go back toward that husband, go back toward that wife, go back toward that brother or sister in Christ who hurt you deeply at one time. And even though they They've apologized, that moment comes back to you in your aggravation the next time something happens, and you have to keep choosing to forgive, to let it go, to let it go over and over again. And you need, we need God's grace and mercy to sur- for relationships to survive. We need God's grace and mercy to bring reconciliation between enemies, to empty pockets for the sake of His work, to convict of sin, to persevere in the face of injustice and suffering of all kinds to repent and apologize after someone has been wrong. This is one thing I've learned about myself and I've seen so much as a pastor and as a brother in Christ. It's amazing how much energy we will put into avoiding owning responsibility for our sin. We need God's grace and mercy just to say the words, I blew it, I failed, I lied, I cheated, I didn't keep my commitment, and just say it right out and and admit it to someone else. We need God's grace and mercy to do that because we'll find, you don't understand how tired I was, you don't understand how much I already do, you don't understand how difficult you are to live with, right, all this kind of stuff, right? We need God's grace and mercy to care enough to confront people when they walk away. We need God's grace and mercy to persist in prayer. We need God's grace and mercy to part from family and friends who reject Jesus. That's been the story of many here that have been a part of Emmanuel, to have God to rescue them in a place that's of great darkness and for them to try to build a new life while other people keep trying to pull them back into that darkness. We need God's grace and mercy to press on the face of seemingly unresolvable disagreements over areas of wisdom that cause brothers and sisters to part from each other. This is probably one of the most painful things in my whole ministry experience. I reread again, uh, and you can find it in the book of Acts, the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas over how to move forward in the mission that God had given them. And it was over, right? Uh, the relative of Barnabas, John Mark, and Barnabas said, I'm going to take him. And Paul says, I'm not taking him. And it was so steep that eventually they had to part, and Paul takes Silas in the place of John Mark, and John Mark goes with Barnabas, and they split from one another, right? Doesn't appear to be any rancor there or any real hatred or things going on, but something was unresolvable that they moved forward on God's mission in different areas, but they could not come to an agreement. And it was an area of wisdom. Was it a thus saith the Lord? Did the Holy Spirit come and say Paul to Paul, do not take John Mark? And Barnabas was listening to the evil one? No. They were both godly men who were trying to follow Christ, and yet at the same time they had a different direction. But we need mercy to follow forward in those moments. As we head toward our 75th celebration of EBC, we are taking the Sundays running up to our anniversary to remember key ways in which God has led this body over the years that contributed to maintaining our identity and mission as his people. To the degree that we reflect God's priorities and passions, this is what God has done through the people of the past to make us the people that we are today. We don't claim, I want to be clear, we don't claim that these represent moments of divine revelation as if God handed down certain directions from heaven, right? This is one of the things that often happens. I have students ask me a lot about, I want to do God's will, I want to follow God's will, Uh, and they want to, how do you know God's will? Well, there are certain things in Scripture that are really clear, right? You can, there are statements like this, this is God's will for you, your sanctification. You can read that in 1 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But there's not statements like, this is God's will, you shall marry her. Right? Now, I've not found that anywhere, even though I'm certain that I have revelation from God with my wife, but right, I've not found that. And about a job you're going to take, about decisions you're going to make with your money, all those kind of things like that, God seems to direct his people by shaping them into his people who have his passions and priorities, and then he calls them to go out and live right, with his mind and passions guiding their choices. 
So we don't claim that they've been revelations from God, nor do we claim that we have flawlessly carried out or implemented them what the body has led us to do, as God has led us. What we are remembering are the ways that his people, in seeking to be faithful to the Lord, have felt the Spirit's leading and have attempted to follow it. These are the ways God has worked to guide, preserve, and shape his people in and through EBC. As the early church said at its first church council, we are remembering those moments when the EBC, that EBC set off in a direction or maintained a heading because, and this comes from the first church council in Acts chapter 15, this is how they rendered their decisions about what the Gentiles had to do to be a part of the early church. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's what we're looking at. So today, we want to look at what seemed to be good to us with regards to our leadership. But I want to say three things, though, about why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we remembering? Three things, okay? Remembering is an important practice for individuals and groups. This is clear throughout Scripture. I, I just challenge you sometime, you go in and put the word remember. I don't care what translation you use. Put the word remember in and you'll find hundreds and hundreds of references calling people to remember what the Lord has done. Major moments of transition biblically are often marked by periods of remembrance. And this is a major transition. Some of you have been brought into the stream of the history of EBC rather uh, recently. And so the past to you is not, you don't understand what this mortgage payoff means for us as a body. This is a major transition for us because this has been a millstone about our necks for decades. And it has been accomplished through difficulties and struggles and tensions and movements forwards and victories. And I attribute it all to God's grace and mercy. There's no reason we should be where we are. All right? So I can't tell you all the story about those, but, but we need to remember God's hand of protection and provision, even in the midst of God always, right? The biblical narratives are always about how God's the hero and how he always accomplishes his purposes, even though his servants are always flawed, half-baked, half-committed people, right? So the reason that Emmanuel exists and we still preach the scriptures, still exalt the name of Jesus, still live each other toward Christ, still support foreign missions around the world, and all that is only attributed to God's mercy on us. God's mercy, right? So individuals facing trials survive through remembering, right? One of the things about remembering, you need to write down things that happen and God does in your life because in times of difficulty when it seems dark and God seems absent, you need to return to those and pull those out and remember, right? Times of blessing call for remembering who is responsible, right? When we're succeeding, remembering is so important because the, one of the most dangerous places biblically is when people are succeeding and God is blessing them and then they forget who's the source of the blessing, they start to take, they take credit for it. So we want to acknowledge and give thanks for God's mercy, grace, and leading in our history. And that came through people and through key moments. And then second, remembering encourages us to be looking to God and listening to God today, right? We want to be led by Him, right? We sang that, the battle belongs to the Lord, Right? And our weapons are the Word of God, prayer, fellowship with one another. Those are the things that God has given us to stay on mission, to be reminded of our identity, right? To protect us from the predations of an evil world, right? To keep us loving people who may despitefully use us. Who's going to enable us to do that? Well, we want to remember that we need to be looking to God and listening to God today. We need Him as much as ever. We need to grow in our trust to Him, and we need Him to lead us into the future beyond this moment where we can finally rest and put this uh, crazy um, mortgage in our past and rest from our relationship with our bank, which we're very happy that they were glad to have that relationship, but we're happy to put them in our past, right? We're happy to do that. We want to rest with that. And then thirdly, let me come here, and thirdly, Remember also will help us, all of us, understand why EBC is the place it is and to better participate in it, right? If you've come in here lately, one of the things, this is a, a G.K. Chesterton idea. That's something that you find all the time. When you walk into a place that you haven't been a part of, you find these fences that are put up in different places. And what I mean by fences are practices or traditions that you find. 
And when you come in, you come from a place where you've had your own practices and traditions. And this is one of the things that we're going to talk about. One of the most important things about navigating life in a church is recognizing that about 80% of what we do is not thus saith the Lord issues. You're saying, well, wait a minute. I thought we were a biblically based church. We are. We are by God's grace. We are. But about 80% of what we do is culturally and wisdom shaped. (laughs) Why do we organize the church service the way we do on Sunday morning? Well, we read it in Ephesians chapter 2. No, we did not right? It's not there. There is no order of church service. Why do we do weddings the way we do? Well, it certainly isn't listed anywhere in Scripture. Why do we have a children's ministry and organize it the way we do? Well, it's not laid out in Scripture to do that. Why do we have a Friday night detention center ministry? Well, that's not thus thou shalt go to the detention center on Fridays, right? There's nothing there. The vast majority of what we do is wisdom. Why do we sing the songs that we sing? Why do we put them in the order the way we do? Right? All those, why do we organize ourselves to accomplish certain tasks the way we do? Right? And I'm going to argue even today, why do we even uh, have the kind of leadership that we have, either among our deacons or among our pastors? These are all wisdom issues. And one of the things here about remembering is not only helps us to understand the people that you're with, right, to understand them, but to help you to participate in it. But also, as you become to understand what's going on, you appreciate the benefits, can also become a participant that may need to step in. And traditions aren't meant to be kept forever. They're only meant to be functional to accomplish God's mission. And maybe we need to change those over time. Right? So we need to be participate as a part of that. So those are some of the reasons why. Right? So now, let's look at the wisdom at a particular period of time of creating a team kind of model of leadership. Okay? Now, I know most of you, if you grew up in the church, most of you grew up with a kind of a model, especially people in this tradition that are represented here at, at uh, Emmanuel, with a single head pastor. I did. The pastor I came to Christ under, his name was Henry Barnhart. Now, I remember Henry Barnhart. I still remember the sermon that he preached the day that I committed my life to Christ with the graphic that he had. Somebody had made a poster for him that had an arrow pointing up to heaven and blue sky and another arrow pointing down to flames and hell. That was dominating the podium. I remember him giving that, sta- that, that message. I still remember that graphic in my head. And I, as a kid now at seven, I'd probably heard the gospel, who knows how many times, the good news about how Jesus had come to save me. I'd heard it over and over again, but for some, some reason, that day it clicked. And I knew it was something more than fear. Okay? Fear is a good motivator when it's motivated by the right thing that you should be afraid of. Right? But I was motivated by more than that because I didn't come to Jesus because I was afraid of what he might do to me. I came to him because I wanted him to deliver me from what I deserved. So the issue here is uh, I had, I've had pastors, uh, Pastor Barnhart, Henry Barnhart, but I also know that, that the model of a single pastor has its benefits and its challenges. The next pastor who came to the church, the reason that I came to Emmanuel in my teenage years was because the next pastor who came in didn't have the skills or the wherewithal to contain the warring parties that blew the church apart. Somehow, Pastor Barnhart was able to keep that together. And when, so we came here, my mom and dad, the Hodsons were a part of that group. We came here with broken spirits and disappointed and hurting And my dad was on a journey of about three years of just spiritual depression because he had invested his life and soul into that building and that church. Deacon, we mowed the grass at the church. We fixed everything that was there. Our life was around that church. We left the city of Xenia to this church in in Kettering with a car full of kids for vacation Bible school and Sunday school every Sunday. And my mom and dad came here depressed and broken in that moment under the leadership of Pastor Bill Wheeler here at Emmanuel. Now, so let me talk to you about this moment where God worked in Emmanuel from these principles. We're going to go back to the principles that, we, that drove us, the scriptural principles, and then come to the idea of why we have this kind of idea of a team of Greg Kowser, Van Holloway, Steve Ruffner, and Will Urschel, and elders yet to be determined, which we're looking forward to in God's providence to bring a part of our team. Now, let me just take you just for a moment. In the late 80s, 
the 1980s. This was before, how many of you were born before the 80s? Okay, I'm going to implicate you. How many are post-80s? All right, okay, all right. So we have to go back to the history books for some. All right, now, so where we were, where we were at this time in the 80s, there was a book that came out by a guy by the name of Alexander Strauch was his name. But what Alexander Strauch wrote about was biblical eldership. And the reason I mention him, he's just one of the major forces. It came out in the late 80s. But early in the, in the 1980s, people from churches of traditions like our own were beginning to ask questions about the fact that when you read in the New Testament, every time pastors are referred to, with only one exception, they're referred to in the plural. There's elders and there's deacons. There's only one place where elder occurs by itself, overseer, and uh, the term overseer, which is a synonym uh, for the office of a pastor, pastor, elder, overseer, the same person in the New Testament by consensus here, the same office, just from different perspectives, pastor, the kind of shepherd idea, elder, someone who has a deep uh, knowledge of God that's been honed by life experience because it had a connotation of age, and overseer is someone who gave spiritual oversight to the body of Christ. So those are three kind of dimensions of a pastor's job. We tend to prefer in America the term for the leader of a church, pastor, right? The main term in scripture is not pastor, it's actually the minimal term, it's actually presbyteros, elder. That's the major term. So most of the time when you see leaders in the church spoken of, they're spoken of as elders. And so um, at that point in time, Strauch wrote this book, uh, myself, and Don Linnell, one of our pastors before this current structure, we were kind of formed in the environment, the seminary environment, where people were talking about this in terms of church structure and ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. And people were beginning to investigate that. Uh, at the same time, there were all kinds of things happening in the culture at large. And then uh, what happened, uh, sadly, uh, as Don Linnell came to be our pastor, he was here for about four years, I believe, something like that, I don't have the exact dates, even though we have those. Uh, sadly, uh, he resigned uh, over some issues that were uh, his personal and had nothing to do with the dynamics of the church per se. And he resigned, but his vision when he came was to move our church to uh, a, a mo an elder model. Well, that was something that I was already very sympathetic to do and already had talked to uh, Bill Wheeler about before. Uh, Will Urschel was a part of the staff at that point in time as we were there. So he arrived in a setting where we were already amenable to that and where we had been thinking about that. And so that was one of the reasons that attracted us to Don as he came in to be our pastor. Sadly, he left before we were able to realize that. But in the aftermath of that, we carried that through, that vision. So Galen was one of our initial elders who's sitting over here. And Will Urschel, Van Holloway, Ed Uzinski, and Brent Howland. Okay? Ed is not with us. He's resigned. Brent Howland is now leading a missions organization that we still support him as a missionary. And then the rest of us are still here, even though Galen has stepped back and now is our kind of elder emeritus, if we put it that way, uh, in terms of that. So let's talk about how we got there, and let's talk about the dynamics of it. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4 and talk about God's vision. So here's where we began. We started with Christ's design for the church. Whatever wisdom should be built on what God says is an absolute necessity. Right. And the absolute necessity here comes in Ephesians 4. Let's see, where did I begin? Verse 11. So Christ gave, himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Okay. Now, most interpreters here is that we've got the uh, prophets and the uh, apostles. These are foundational gifts. You can read those in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, earlier on, that God gave them as the founders of the churches. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, as Paul would say, with Christ as the chief cornerstone. On top of that, he gave evangelists, people gifted to share the gospel and bring people to Christ, but also pastors and teachers and most agree that that's a reference to the same office, a pastor teacher is how you often hear it referred to. Someone who cares for the needs of the flock and someone who does it through teaching, right? Teaching uh, the scriptures to the people. So these are God's gifts that came to us through Christ. And he says here to equip, and then he gives the, the, the reason for these gifts, to equip his people for works of service 
so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, what do we find here in this uh, passage? Some things I want to go after. Well, he talks about pastor teachers, right? And this is something uh, uh, some people say, I've known some pastors that, I, that are certainly not gifts, right? I hope, I hope we don't have that relationship at EBC. At least I'm not aware of that right at the moment. But if the right person, right, if we look more deeply, which we're not going to today, as far as the church is concerned, their leaders are people who have been urged by God, been given a desire by God to function as the pastor or as an elder, but that urge gets affirmed by the congregation. This is why if you read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that somebody who desires to be a pastor needs to have certain kind of qualities and the body of Christ needs to look into them to see if they're the right kind of people. So not any person, any man can be a pastor. It has to be the right kind of men whose calling, if you want to use that term, has been affirmed by the body of Christ. Okay? So it's a key idea. And so when you come to those... These gifted people are God's gifts. You can also read about this in 1 Corinthians 3 that talks about the gifts to the church. The purpose is to equip his people for works of service. Okay? Now, this is a key idea. The role of the pastor is not to be the one who does everything that the church should be doing. The church is supposed to equip people to be able to fully serve Christ. They should be producing disciples who they themselves can produce disciples, if you will. And so the pastor is not meant to be, nor the pastoral team, to be the, you know, the SWAT team that's called out whenever there's a difficulty, a spiritual challenge, right? Now, the pastor should be involved in everything that's going on as best they can be, but if they're doing their job, what should happen is that we should unleash 300 people to be pastors and effective ministers of Christ wherever they are. And so our job is to equip so not to do the service for them, but to enable them to know Christ and so be transformed so that his passions and priorities become theirs. That's the key idea. Our goal is to love Christ and to love you to love Christ. And as Christ shapes us and motivates us and challenges, he's going to change us in our families. He's going to change us in our neighborhood. He's going to change us at our workplace. So that's our job. And then the second idea in 12b through 13, and in knowing Christ... This will drive and enable them to love their brothers and sisters and their unsaved neighbors as Christ, toward Christ. Christ's passions and priorities shape our individual lives and our life together. So this is what he says here in 12b, right? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is Paul's language for having my inner world completely redesigned so that I love what Jesus loves and I want what he wants and so that I'm inter as I'm interacting with Sarah Mays and I'm looking at her life I'm evaluating her life and her words and her actions from the perspective of what God wants her to do and to be and as I see her following Christ and obeying Christ and honoring Christ I'm back there cheering you go Mayor Mays right I'm back there cheering you do it Right? But if I see her deviating from what Christ has called her to be as a person, as a wife, as a, as a, a, as a sister in Christ, well, then I'm concerned, and I want to I go speak to her and say, Sarah, what's going on? Because I want her to want what Christ wants for her. That's what I want. And so as we're engaging, we become a group of people because I don't have the same kind of relationship with you that somebody else does. Some of us have spheres of influence that it's your responsibility before God to be especially concerned about. Your family, the people you work with, your neighbors that you live around, your extended family, you have a voice and a place in their lives that I don't. And you're the voice and presence of Jesus in those places. And so we're called, 
right, to produce in one another by our actions that we want to grow one another in Christ. And then the second thing here is so that we won't be babies, right? This we could stand here and talk about what spiritual babies look like, right, in terms of this. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming, right? We live in a world that is not under the control of our king. We live in a world that's in opposition to him in many, many ways. It doesn't mean everything that comes to us from the world is in opposition to Christ and his rule, but we live in a world that wants us to elevate ourselves, to put us at the center of all of life, to pay attention to what I feel as what's right and good. Instead, Scripture wants to say, no, no, you've been created by God. You need to listen to him to, tell him, to let him tell you who you are to let him tell you what really matters, to let him tell you what it looks like to love yourself and your neighbor. Right? So infants, we don't want to be people who are easily persuaded by falsehood. And we don't want to, especially in the church, we don't want to be people who elevate things that don't matter to divisive issues. Right? And that takes some real wisdom to do that. Right? To recognize that we can have difference of opinions on all kinds of things because God didn't say, thus saith the Lord on that. But sometimes we elevate our own personal preferences so high that we can't fellowship with other people who love Jesus and then we're like babies squabbling in the toddler nursery over the one toy, right? Or over the control of a given area. And we need God's wisdom to grow up. And so the leaders are meant to draw us to Christ so that we can figure out what the main things are and stick with the main things and know the things that are not thus saith the Lord, right? As I was talking with you a little while ago when we talk about marriage relationships, the vast majority of the things that you do as a husband and wife are not thus saith the Lord things. So one of the things that happens, you see a couple that comes into marriage and she steps into the marriage, sometimes they refer to this as contracts, and she came out of a family where the husband had very prescribed roles. Number one, he carries out the trash. That's just what husbands do, right? It's very important. If you're going to be a good husband, you take the trash out, right? And also, if you're a husband, these were ones in my marriage. And also, if you're a, if you're a husband, you fix things that are broken. That's your job. The wife's job is to report the things that are broken to you, <laughs> right? Right? Still, today, it's just, we have very clearly defined roles, Right, with terms of that, she points it out and then she also is the keeper of the time as to what's the appropriate time that it should be fixed, right? You get those two, right? I mean, that's a constant joke. If you look at those kind of things, I, I'm going to ask you and then finally, right, we've had those moments. Of course, Ron and I never disagree except for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, I'm just We just never disagree. But, you know, at times, you know, I've timed out and she's just going to do it herself, right? But are, all, are any of those things thus saith the Lord? No about how to keep your home, about the level of cleanliness in it, about what's appropriate. They're not going to say it to the Lord, but you as a, as a lover of your wife or lover of your husband, you want them to feel this is their home. You want them to enjoy this space. You want to help them flourish. You don't want to dominate and control them if your heart is right with the Lord. And you're trying to make a place where you both live and it's your home, not the home of one of you that somebody is privileged to live in, right? And so the same thing happens to a church. The vast majority, this is why we stretch and struggle because we get vested in our preferences and we like the way things are and we haven't reckoned with the idea that they really just are preferences. Music styles, they're preferences. Music content, well, that's a theological issue we want to think about. But why we organize ourselves the way we do, why we decorate the things the way we do, what ministries we have, who runs the ministries, these are wisdom issues that we make that can really get the church all turned around. And we don't want to be infants. We don't be squabbling over things that we shouldn't be squabbling over. And matter of fact, we should be energized, most importantly, by the mission that God has for us in our homes, in our lives, in our city, right? And then the third thing here is the goal, right, then is to produce maturity, to move us away from infant status, right? Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ, right? Now, the issue here about speaking the truth in love, this is really a, a phrase that's hard to translate because it has to do with more than speaking verbally. 
It really just says living truthfully toward one another. Okay? And this is a little bit more comprehensive. It's, it's, it's interacting with one another. It's life on life. Right? And this it, it mitigates against, uh, militates against a model of the church that's just like a... Uh, um, uh, a lecture course, or where your consumers that are coming in to shop and critique and do a Yelp review after you leave, or your spectators in the stands while the other performers are down here uh, on, this, on the uh, uh, playing field. No, this is a place where we're all involved and we're growing together in Christ, and the issue is here is we're living truthfully toward one another. And this, this is more than, more than just being genuine and authentic. Right? This, is, this is that you want to come to follow Jesus so that the way you interact with other people speaks to the truth of the way that you're to love one another. The way you address the other person, the way you look them in the eye, the way you pay attention to them, what you talk about and don't talk about, you're truthing it all the time. And our lives are leaving a wake on each other. Right? Every parent in here knows, right? Every parent in here knows you can say, say, say all you want, but if your life speaks louder than your words, you can just shut your mouth. Right? You can say, say, say all you want, but if the way you treat your wife or the way you treat your husband doesn't look like the love that you're trying to commend to your toddlers and children, right? Your life will speak louder than your words. Right? So we're, we're called to live the truth in front of others, to love one another, to come after one another, to, to betray the character and passions of Jesus with each other. And so then finally, the goal then, which is from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So you have an interdependent group of people who love each other to Christ as Christ so that they reflect his passions and priorities, right? This is something here Here's uh, one of the things that you know the evil one will do. He will want to make you hide from the people in this room. He will want to make you learn how to be friendly and engaged without ever being known. Because he's trying to rob you of the resources of being known by people who are going to protect you from the darkness in your soul of being known by people who can encourage you to see something in you that God has done that you can't see and therefore give you hope and encouragement, to rob you of someone who can bring wisdom into your life to help you navigate some problem that you don't feel like you can get out of, to get you as a marriage through something where you just feel like we've talked and talked and talked and I feel hopeless right now. Well, who can, well maybe somebody's going to come in and give you a word to help you get over that hump. Maybe you've been injured or hurt or disappointed by God, you feel. And somebody needs to come back in and remind you of God's character, of his goodness, of his history over the past, of how God can take darkness and redeem it and turn beauty and make and ashes and make beauty out of it. Maybe you need that because you need comfort that comes to you through the people of God. And so one of the things he's going to encourage you to do, he's going to encourage you to distance yourself and be, be uh, hide in plain sight. He's going to encourage you to be the consummate critic that gives you reasons not to make yourself vulnerable to people because you'll find enough faults that say this is not, this is not wise. Well, yeah, if you look at any of us for any length of time, are you going to find some brokenness? Yes. I'm, I'm trusting Jesus that I need to be a part of this group of people, that I need to be known by them, that they need to look into my life because I need resources out of myself that God has provided. So, we need each other. So the only way we're going to survive is if we open our lives to each other and we uh, look to each other for help and blessing. Now, we added this, and this is real quickly. We added to the wisdom is that there seems to be two offices in the New Testament, pastors and deacons. So we wanted to have pastors and deacons. But what we concluded as we looked at these, and we come here, is that we found out um, this is one of the things that many of you, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Anybody been part of a Presbyterian organization before? Some Presbyterians with us, right? Uh, how about uh, any in Methodist circles? Some there? Methodist? Okay, I could ask Mickey. I think she's been in the mall, right, Mickey? Right? So Mickey is our, 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 she's our experience of all churches on her spiritual journey, right? 
So those kind of things. But one of the things you ever notice, and there are Bible-believing Christians who love, uh, love Jesus in the Presbyterian church. There are Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus in the Methodist church. There are Bible-believing uh, Christians in different organizations. But one of the things you find out, the Methodists and the Presbyterians don't organize their churches the way we do. And you know what they claim is authority for their organizational structures? The Bible. You know what we claim authority for? The Bible. Uh, but one of the things that we recognize, and one of the reasons why we don't separate from the Presbyterians, for example, simply because they have a presbytery, a governing body that governs a group of churches in a region, and they report to that, we don't have that governing body. And the reason why we don't separate from them, and they don't separate from us in terms of that and say you can't be Christian and do that, because we recognize that that's a matter of wisdom. It's a matter of wisdom, meaning the people of God in a particular tradition have thought that this is a good way to operate. Well, why is that? Because when you look at the scriptures, you find that usually churches have pastors, plural. Right? So James 5, it says when you're sick and you're in the darkest period of your life and you, need to, you want to bring God's wisdom to bear on one of the scariest moments in your life, you call for the elders, plural. Not pastor, elders, plural. Right? Which assumes that it's there. There's no, and then when you come to deacons, the deacons are always plural. We've never had problems with plural deacons. We've always had a group of them, right? But there's no explicit structure within their plurality, right? So you know what God doesn't give to us? He doesn't say the structure of the pastors is there's a head pastor, there's an assistant pastor, there's an assistant assistant pastor, there's a, a you know, a um, worship pastor, there's a um, discipleship pastor, there's a, a, a family pastor. Now, none of that structure is in Scripture. You won't find any of those. Any of those there. Well, why do they do them? Because they felt that that's a wise way to go about meeting the needs of their congregation, given certain things, right? But there's no explicit. There's nothing about deacons, anybody who's been a part of the Baptist tradition forever, right? There, there is just a whole genre of deacon jokes out there, Right? about who deacons are and what they do and so forth and so on. Well, deacons usually had a chair of the deacon board. Well, you won't find the office of chair of the deacon board in the Bible. Doesn't sound very biblical. Well, it's a matter of wisdom, right? Why do we do that? So we, there's no explicit structure. So when somebody comes back to you and say, we do this because the scriptures demand, one of the things we don't want to be as, as believers is know when we're talking about an issue, whether it truly is what scripture demands or not. Okay? Then the third thing, any hierarchy among pastors appears to be occasional. This is one of the interesting things that happens in the development of the church. You can see this in Acts 15 as they're making decisions. When it came to the early church and they were deciding about when the Gentiles were coming into the body about what should be required of them, there wasn't one person who stood up and said, this is what we're doing and everybody followed suit. They had a discussion. And then they decided... And James, who seemed to be the one who had God's wisdom, said, this is, I think, what we do. And everybody agreed, and that's the way they went forward. But not because James was the leader that everybody had to follow. He was one of the leaders. And then historically, various church structures arose in response to the needs of a rapidly expanding church. Now, I'm not going to take you through the early church history in terms of that. But one of the things that happened with a guy like by the name of Ignatius, who came along, uh, as you study the development of the church, is what happened is he became this wise leader that many local pastors deferred to on wisdom issues and grew into kind of a hierarchical position. But that wasn't because it was thus saith the Lord. It was kind of the way the church kind of moved in that moment. And at the Reformation, that kind of uh, putting up everything underneath the Pope, that whole thing was just, you know, sledgehammered at the bottom. And now it's broken down. Right? If you're within the Catholic Church, you're still in that model right, of one ultimate head. Okay? So what we're doing with is something that's a matter of wisdom for the time. So these are our values. And so this is one of the things that we're eventually going to have around our auditorium here in, in the coming days. But when you come to a manual, this is what we believe. We believe that God desires that the body of Christ be led by elders and served by deacons under the leadership of those elders. Okay? Now this is a key thing. One of the things that has happened, and I don't go through the history of that, one of the things that has happened, uh, sometimes in churches that have a pastor and deacons, the deacons, especially in our tradition, functioned like an elder board. When I first came here, the deacons were actually governing the pastor. 
And it took me a little while to figure it out. And as I had conversations with Pastor Wheeler, I found out that the deacons were functioning as a elder board who were standing over the pastor and the pastor was their employee. Now that's not how I understand the role of a deacon. The role of a deacon is a servant to the pastors, right? So when you look at it in Acts chapter six, what may be the origins of that very office is the deacons were bought in to take care of needs so that the elders could stay focused on study of scripture and prayer. So in the development of that, so deacons, we also believe that our structuring of those offices must allow the church to maximize the potential of its leadership to grow, protect, enable, and mobilize the body for his glory, okay? Now, this has led us to uh, another value that we have here about spiritual uh, leadership. We believe, right, so all of my thespians here, I'm going to use some drama metaphors, right? So Grant woke up back there uh, as we talk about that. But talk about, I don't know, and this is trying to get at a key value at EBC. If you're here at EBC, you should be serving. You should be involved somewhere. You should not be a spectator. And we're going to go out of all the issues that, well, I don't know what I have to offer. Well, if you've been saved and brought to Christ, you've been gifted by him and you've been called to serve his body. Final. You should be, there should be nobody who's not involved. That's why, to use this metaphor here, I want you to think about it. We believe that leadership must lead the body of Christ by life and word to perform God's script. What is his script? His script is right here. Right? To live it out. And it's an interdependent body, right? To understand, embody, and commend the transformative work of God in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, right? So the goal of what we do here is for us to come into the riches of what God has made possible for us in Christ, to live it out, to experience it, to see transformed marriages, to see parents who love their kids to Jesus, to see kids who respond to their parents in a way that is indicative of, of children who know Jesus, to see men and women who are respected by each other and feel safe in each other's presence and don't feel reduced to objects or things to be manipulated or used. So that's our goal. And so what it means, God is the play, right? It's his script, right? So one of the things here is one of our core values. This is the center of what we do. This is the center, not, not the headlines, not the latest uh, uh, movement that's out there, not the, the thing that's pushing us culturally in a given way, but it has to be that, not just, not tradition, right? Not some, doing something just because it's always been done, but because it's rooted in the scripture or taught directly by scripture. That has to be it. So that's why we teach from the scriptures. That's why we make it our, our, our reference point. That's why when you go to our doctrinal statement, it's the truths that are developed from the scripture, that constrain our identity. Jesus is the master performer. This is why always scripture, Christ is the beginning of the Christian life. How do you become a believer? How do you get transformed? By knowing Jesus. Jesus is the ongoing reality of the Christian life. You're being transformed into his likeness by the power of the spirit that he made possible. And the ultimate goal is you will be fashioned into his image. He's the beginning, middle, and the end. So we look to Jesus, right, to use Hebrews, we look to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, right? We look to him, we follow him, right? As Paul said in Ephesians 4, till we all be filled up with the fullness of the image of Jesus, right? So he's the standard, and then the Holy Spirit is the enabler and the director. The Spirit of God is at work, convicting us, transforming us, moving us, sustaining us, Everybody in here who's hung in your marriage when it's been difficult, the Holy Spirit has sustained you. Everybody's held on to your identity in Christ when the pressures in your, in your work room or your, your school environment has pushed you in a different direction. It's the Spirit of Jesus. It's the, it's the Spirit of Jesus that has called you back when you've wandered and drifted. It's the Spirit of Jesus that sustains you in hope when you go through darkness and difficulty. It's the spirit of Jesus that comes to you and say, Greg, you were an idiot. You need to go apologize. And so elders and pastors and deacons are assistant directors or actors, right? We're supposed to be embodying these truths ourselves. If you want to read about it in Hebrews 13, it, it, is, it is weighty to think that you're invited and actually encouraged to look at my way of life and imitate it. You can read about it in Hebrews 13, 17. 
it immediately makes me want those disclaimers, right? Like every parent in your home, right? You're hoping your kids will pick up every good thing from you. Sadly, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, you get to see a portrait of yourself there and you go, oh my goodness, where'd that come from? And your spouse looks over at you. Right there. Right there's where it came from. And you go, oh, oh. And we're aware of our flaws, right? And one of the things that should be true about me, should be true about the fellow elders, is I am flawed. I don't use that to excuse my behavior, but I understand my own limitations. There should be a real humility about it. I don't know everything. I don't know how to do everything. I'm not competent in every way. And for me to know that is actually healthy for me. And actually, one of the key things that I need to do before you is teach you how to deal with your failures, how to deal with your insecurities, how to clean up the messes that you made, right? Because I'm going to make my own messes, right? So it's not calling for me to be Christ in the sense that I can't be, right? I often joke with, when I'm talking to my, my students who are preparing for ministry, when you look at the list in Scripture about the qualifications for a leader, one of the ways you could look at it is, what level of dysfunction is acceptable? That's really what you're asking. What level of dysfunction is acceptable? Because are there any perfect pastors? No. Any perfect pastoral families? No. Right? So if we had to be perfect to be a pastor, we would all be looking at an empty stage up here, right? There'd be nobody here. And so the issue here is we're looking for people with patterns of life that they're, and then the body of Christ is the cast. This means we're all in the play. Some, of, some people are up front, some people here, some people in the children's ministry, some people, but where are you in the play? There's no body in the church who's in the seats observing. We're not the audience, we're the cast. You get that? Seriously. We're in the cast. And some of it can be, you're a prayer warrior. Right? You're a prayer warrior. You take on, and you're praying for people, and you're, you, you, get the, you hear what's going on in the church, you pay attention to the list, you get your members list out, you're praying through people, you're a prayer warrior, because you know that the evil one is active, trying to destroy marriages, trying to draw people's affections away from Jesus, trying to re revisit old habits, trying to give people to give in to their insecurities and their past regrets. Right? You know he's busy. And so you're, you're doing battle, right? Or you're serving in an area, or you're praying before the service that comes that, Lord, use this moment. Right? All those kind of things. But we're the cast. We're not the audience. We're the cast, okay? And then the stage is the world. We're living out, right? And you get to so many different passages here. Philippians chapter 2, if you want to look at 1, verses 12 through 18. Philippians 2, 12 through 18. He's, he's rebuking the Philippians. He's concerned about them. He says, you're meant to be a light, a bright shining light of what it looks like when Jesus transforms your heart and soul. But instead, you're very close to becoming a part of the dark and perverse people around you. You need to hold forth the word of life in your marriages. Hold forth the word of life in your home. Hold forth the word of life in your computer habits. Hold forth the word of life in your money spending. Hold forth the word of life in your social media habits. Hold forth the word of life in your workplace. That's who we're called to be, right? And some of it has the way we love each other and treat each other, okay? So here's this teamwork idea that came. So we believe, right, at Emmanuel, in our history, the gift and this ability and time required for the responsibility of shepherding our local church cannot be fulfilled by a single man and are not consistent with the interdependent image of the body of Christ. Now, even all kinds of leadership studies will tell you by the time you get a church of any size, over 100, 150 people, one person cannot attend to them in any sensible way as a shepherd. So how churches do that for us, we want to multiply our elders so we want to have enough elders so that we can pay attention to the people here in the church. So we know what's going on in their lives. We can pray for them, engage with them. We believe the various responsibilities of the elders should be allocated among the elders based on their gifts, abilities, and availability. Um, we're resisting a little bit here at EBC, as are many churches, is that there are different models that get thrust upon a pastor, and one of those models are the executive of a organization. So he needs to be a business guru and, and a leader. 
uh, and that kind of thing. Whereas in Scripture, the gift of being able to administer uh, and oversee is certainly there, but that doesn't mean that you're a CEO of a profit ministry or non-profit ministry. And so the idea of having the CEO is a model that brings some goodness and also brings some challenges to the notion of what a pastor is. This is why we also mitigate against a pastor who is just so singular in a given role and set off to it that he doesn't actually have interaction with the people in the church. So allocate the biggest abilities. We believe all elders share in ensuring their tasks are all being accomplished in our local body and all elders have input in how these tasks are accomplished. Right? Now this leads to our, our last one I'm going to mention today. We believe in elder council structures in which each elder shares equally in the position, authority, and responsibility of the office and provides the best environment to use gifts and wisdom provided to each elder by the Holy Spirit and we are committed to a principle of consensus. And so we don't have an elder who's the first among equals who gets 10 votes and the rest of us get a half a vote. Uh, we don't have uh, a, a kind of an idea of a person who tells the rest of us what to do. But we all work together and we come by consensus to our decisions as we do that. And if it happens where, this hasn't happened recently that I know of, but it has happened all across the time, where Van comes in and he has a decision uh, that disagrees with the consensus of the other three, uh, then the onus is on Van to explain why he thinks this is so right and important that he wants to resist uh, the consensus of the other three. And eventually we want to talk that through until we all agree to move in the same direction. Right? So these are our values that we feel is God's leading to us as a church. And again, I want to say the core, the core biblical teaching is there are pastors and there are deacons. And the elders are meant to guide, direct the church and oversee it and pastor it. The deacons come alongside of them to facilitate that task. There is no scriptural teaching straightforwardly, thus saith the Lord, about how these elders organize themselves or how the deacons. So everything underneath that is a matter of wisdom. So as we talk about it as a church and as we move forward in this next phase of our history, right, it's one of those things we want to keep a part of our discussion about how we move forward uh, in that area of wisdom uh, to guide and direct our church. Now here's the things, uh, and, and uh, I'll end here. These are the areas of wisdom that uh, has, has guided us, that have guided us to the structure that we have, okay? And I won't spend much time here, but we recognize and utilize the various strengths and gifts of qualified elders. We do not feel, right, that scripture makes it clear that for a person to be a qualified elder, they have to be able to speak in front of large audiences. That is kind of an American kind of idea of an elder. Do we think they need to be able to teach? Yes, but teaching can occur in lots of different settings. Two, deliberate about peer accountability. Uh, we want to hold each other accountable. One of the things that we have found over the history that is always a problem with the single pastor model, uh, which continues to be, let me just say this out of there is no way to structure fallen on the way people to protect from every type of brokenness. There is no fail-safe structure. One of the things that has characterized over this last couple of years for any of us that have followed the larger body of Christ and things that have happened, to see some major leaders at the top of large organizations fall spectacularly. One of the dangers about the single pastor model is the person is uh, raised to a point where they have no accountability, and a lot of times pastors try to seek that out by other pastors around town or somewhere else, but they have no accountability. Then uh, iron to sharpen iron, we hope to grow each other, target workload to gifting, allows extensive connections to the body, it spreads out the workload among four of us. Attempts to model community in its operations and relationships. We want to be people who get along with each other, that speak well of each other, uh, that, that rightfully uh, speak to each other and about each other. And then uh, functional hierarchy with appointed leadership. So functional meaning uh, we often defer to each other's decisions based on the decision that's here, but it's not because that person has a permanent, uh, thus saith the Lord, position. That is the wisdom that has led us to the point where we are. So, as we move into this next phase, and I close this for today, right, I've got a couple of things to do here 
uh, as a close. But um, uh, I want to encourage you, right now is a crucial moment at EBC. I want you to consider what role are you playing because you're in the cast. You're in the cast. You're not in the audience. What role are you playing? What role are you playing? Two, as you reflect on the issues here, are you able to work through in your own mind as a Christian as you're growing, what is thus saith the Lord as opposed to what your assumptions are and your preferences are? Are you navigating your relationships in the body of Christ by elevating the most important things or by elevating your preferences? Right? Third, as we move into this new moment, pray, seek the Lord. We're, we're looking for God's wisdom and direction about this next phase. You know, one of the things that, that we realize when this mortgage comes to an end, you know about how much money a year we're spending on the bank? About $70,000 a year. What can we do by God's grace with that $70,000 instead of give it to the bank? God may use you to be the person to give us a vision for where we're going. Right? Where are we going? God sustains vision. God moves us forward, right? So I'm going to ask you to pray for that. Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for Jesus. Uh, Lord, we... We want to be the church that you have called us to be. And above all, we want to be faithful to you. Uh, we want to preach about you. We want to reflect you in the way that we live and interact. And Lord, I pray for our people, Lord, as we celebrate and look back. Lord, I pray that you will enable some of those that haven't been a part of this journey, Lord, to enter into, uh, Lord, a deeper understanding of the people that they're a part of. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to think through uh, Lord, the way we structure ourselves and, and operate, Lord, we want to follow you the best we can. Lord, help us to be moldable. Help us to work well with each other. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Help us to play our parts together. So we give you the thanks in Christ's name. Amen.